public enemy number one. We start this hour with the opioid epidemic. In the United States. It's an opioid emergency with is drug abuse. These overdoses are driven. 142 people die by a massive increase in addiction every day. Opioid epidemic to prescription painkillers from opioid killing. Opioid epidemic, opioid crisis, these terms are now ubiquitous. They've crept into our collective vocabulary as if propelled by an advertising blitz for a new soft drink. If it's a campaign, it's work. And much like a public relations plan or political ad, the line between fact and fiction has been blurred. Across the country, elected officials, regulators, and medical professionals have been swept up in the moment without pausing very long to think or question. Journalists in particular have gone along for the ride. Drug overdoses, opioid overdoses, prescription overdoses, they're reported as all the same, except they're not. The one voice not heard above the national hubbub is that of the chronic pain patient. Tens of millions of them. They've been drowned out, ignored, dismissed as addicts in what appears to be a new war on drugs. The opioid crackdown has already affected millions of lives, people whose only mistake is that they got sick or injured. One in three Americans experiences chronic pain. They've had little or no say in the drastic changes that are now underway. An estimated 100 million Americans suffer with chronic pain, that is pain lasting longer than three months. Most get by without opioid medications, but for 10 million or more, opioids are a lifeline, the only way they're able to lead somewhat normal lives. Not surprisingly, studies show those who live with chronic pain are at a greater risk of suicide. Metro Police says Broderick was a patient at the pain clinic and on Thursday demanded to be seen right away. When he was refused, he came back with a gun and started shooting. When Las Vegas mental health counselor Chad Broderick shot up a pain clinic before taking his own life back in June, some media reports explained it as the actions of a drug addict. Those who knew Broderick say it wasn't addiction that drove him over the edge, it was pain. He couldn't take it anymore. Modern medicine has helped us live longer to survive cancer, car accidents, you name it. But survival often means a lifetime of pain. Most doctors are simply not trained to treat chronic pain. I've been through overtreatment, undertreatment, mistreatment, no treatment. Barbie Engel was a coach at a major university, ran her own business, was happily married. Pain took it all away. Every single aspect of your life, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, it wiped me out. Serious injuries put her in a wheelchair for seven years, which caused other painful diseases, including something called RSD. And it feels like someone put lighter fluid on me, caught me on fire, and that's just really difficult to put out. 43 doctors later, she was treated with a powerful pain medication and got her life back. What happened to me should never happen to anybody. You should she now not advocates have for other pain patients who have, in effect, become opioid on. refugees. You know, Opiates shouldn't be taken off the table because there's a media hype and there's a hysteria. Chronic pain takes over people's lives. It's all they can think about. Janita Hall's lupus has caused blinding pain for years. If I let it get to the point where it incapacitates me, I can't move, I can't get out the bed, I can't stand up, I can't do anything because I'm in so much pain. This Henderson man's lupus causes pain so intense it defies description. You just want to lead your life as normally as possible and when you're in that much pain you just you can't do anything else. Opiates have been used by humans to control pain for thousands of years. Newer synthetic opioids are not appropriate for treating all pain, but are life altering for millions of people. We start this hour with the opioid epidemic. That word opioid is now a staple of nightly newscasts, and the reports typically include images of prescription bottles and pills, implying that legal medications are responsible for that oft-cited number. 64,000 drug-related deaths per year, an epidemic, a crisis. Journalists dutifully and incorrectly recite that same misleading number. Pain expert Dr. Michael Shatman conducted his own survey during one 24-hour network news cycle. And I put in one word, 
opioid. And I got 75 stories. And every story had some combination of the words epidemic, overdose, abuse, death. Dr. Shatman, um, an internationally no, known pain authority, has spent much of his life getting um, patients off opioids. He data. cautions against their use, except as a last resort, but says the numbers used to generate anti-opioid hysteria are both exaggerated and distorted on purpose. In a recent paper, Shatman wrote that the more conservative number, 16,000 overdose deaths attributed to legal prescriptions is still a massive exaggeration. The most current, most accurate health statistics in the country are from New Hampshire, among the deadliest opioid battlegrounds in North America. 80% of the opioid deaths were due to, we'll say, non-pharmaceutical uh, fentanyl. Because it is uh, an analog of fentanyl, which is a prescription drug, um, it goes down as a prescription opioid death. New figures from New Hampshire show some 93% of drug overdoses were caused by either fentanyl or heroin or both. Across the country, the states with the most overdoses have seen huge increases in illicit fentanyl. Nationally, fentanyl deaths jumped 540% in a three-year period. In western states, the illicit opiate of choice is still heroin, which is cheap, plentiful, and far more powerful than in years past. Illicit fentanyl and heroin are the drivers of overdose today. Those are illicit opioids. They're Social scientist Dr. Steven Ziegler says it makes zero sense for doctors to essentially punish and abandon chronic pain patients when more than 90% of opioid deaths are the result of addicts taking street drugs. We're focusing on prescribers for a problem that is significantly being driven by an illicit market. So it's almost like we're arresting the wrong person. And when you arrest the wrong person, that means the real suspects are still out there in the loose causing harm. Lives are being lost in record numbers. Nevada has seen a similar overheated reaction. An opioid task force was formed to lobby the legislature. New, stricter standards are being imposed on doctors because of what's described here as an opioid epidemic. The state's own numbers, however, show opioid prescriptions and overdoses have declined every year since 2011, except in one category, heroin deaths. Drill down into the actual case files as reported by the Clark County Coroner, and it's even more apparent nearly all of the deaths involve multiple substances, including heroin, methadone, methamphetamine, cocaine, and alcohol and many of the dead also had serious underlying medical conditions. But anyone who has a trace of an opioid in their systems is counted as an opioid death. A study came out just this year um, looking at the toxicology of people who died of you know, supposed prescription opioid deaths. The average number of substances found in the system, including alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, um, tranquilizers, uh, generally benzodiazepines, was six. We're not talking about 16,000 prescription opioid deaths. We're talking more about 1,600. Millions of our fellow citizens are already Addicted. Public That's figures from the president on down have weighed in on the opioid issue. It's a time-honored tradition. Public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. For more than a century, American politicians have scored points by declaring war on various drugs. What I've seen happening to our children is terribly frightening. Heroin, cocaine, marijuana, all of which are still widely available. Unlike previous wars on drugs, the new campaign has a less elusive target, drugs that are legally prescribed and regulated. For the chronic pain patients, it's really, really scary times right now. Very scary. Retired pharmacist Rick Martin is in pain most of the time, but he still writes letters and lobbies on behalf of fellow pain patients, though it's fallen on deaf ears. The CDC's supposedly voluntary guidelines have been enacted into law almost everywhere, forcing drastic cuts in opioid prescriptions for millions of patients. People are dying. People are committing suicide right now 
because their doctor involuntarily tapered them downward or off their opioid medications and the CDC nowhere did they recommend that. I've been seeing where, like I said, patients with cancer were, and were going to die eventually were in the hospital to where they would not get pain medication because the nurse or the doctor were afraid they'd become addicted. The impetus started about 15 years ago when doctors, pharmacy chains, and drug companies unleashed a new generation of pain medications. Pill mills flourished, patients died, but the pill mills have since been shut down. All the records show is that the prescribing hit its peak in 2010 and the, the number of opioids and the amount of opioids being prescribed has been in decline ever since then. Pat Anson of the Pain News Network thinks the CDC knew exactly what would happen when it issued supposedly voluntary guidelines. CDC drafted those guidelines in secrecy. They knew right away and they did it illegally too. They did it without holding public hearings like they were supposed to. In March 2016, the CDC issued what it called voluntary guidelines, suggestions for general practitioners about how to rein in opioid prescriptions, including a proposed cap on daily dosages called a morphine equivalent standard. The notion of mor morphine equivalent daily dosing is just absurd. Pain expert Dr. Michael Shatman says there is no science whatsoever behind a morphine equivalent standard and that it is preposterous to declare that when it comes to pain medication, one size fits all. In a scathing paper recently published, Shatman and his co-author pummeled CDC for creating guidelines in total secrecy. The identities of the expert committee were not revealed, even when six members of Congress wrote to ask what was going on. When the names finally leaked, they were widely regarded as anti-opioid crusaders. CDC used exaggerated data to justify its guidelines, Chapman said, and his paper noted CDC had never even mentioned chronic pain on its website prior to issuing the guidelines. Worst of all, the guidelines were adopted as law by states all over the U.S. Unfortunately, insurance companies, state regulators, health insurance quality organizations, have all decided to ignore the specific content of the CDC guideline and to kind of weaponize it. So they've taken some dose thresholds and said, look, uh, we're going to force the dose down, whether the patient likes it or not, whether the doctor likes it or not. Thirteen different medical organizations, including the American Cancer Society, complained about the lack of transparency in the CDC process and the likelihood that patients in extreme pain would be denied treatment. CDC responded by hiring a PR firm to promote the guidelines further. Pain doctor Forrest Tennant thinks this sends a loud well, message. The federal government is sort of giving the message we don't care if you die. We don't care if you suffer. We don't care if you lose your doctor. We don't care if you have unnecessary surgery. We don't care if you're called a drug addict or have to go into a mental health center. We don't care anymore. The CDC has been asked to clarify the mistaken interpretation of its supposedly voluntary guidelines. Instead, it hired a PR company and in 2018 will unleash a series of television ads to bolster its message. The CDC refuses to say how much it's spending on that PR campaign. Up next, American doctors have been intimidated into complying with the guidelines, even those who think it's bad for their patients. crackdown on opioid prescriptions is intended to curb the addiction crisis. However, most of the people who are overdosing aren't getting the pills from a legal source. Still, legitimate patients and compliant doctors are the ones being scrutinized. Denise Valdez explains why doctors fear guidelines go too far. Try to create a relaxing, um, soothing environment for the patients so it could be just kind of an oasis when they get here. Dr. Um, Daniel Laird has been a pain quiet. specialist for more than two decades, treating thousands of patients using a mix of Western and Eastern approaches, yoga, acupuncture, Sounds aromatherapy, good. and only prescribing opioids as a last resort. But since the Center for Disease Control issued stricter guidelines, severely limiting dosages, everyone in the opioid chain is alarmed. Everybody's afraid. The pharmacist is afraid, the pharmacy manager is afraid, the district manager is afraid, 
The doctor's afraid, the nurses are afraid, nobody wants to be a accused of being a drug dealer or a drug dispenser or a drug pusher and so everybody's constantly looking over their shoulder. This is the pain questionnaire that I have patients fill out every Laird files nearly 50 visit. pages of paperwork per visit if, if per on, patient. He doles out opiates much more frequently than other doctors so he is keenly aware that the feds and state agencies are monitoring him. I suppose that Every doctor has this horror scenario in his mind or her mind that the DEA is going to show up with, at your office door with a pair of handcuffs and confiscate all of your patient files and you'll be hauled off to federal prison. Throughout the state of Montana, it's been like the Taliban took over pain management in Montana. It's kind of crazy. Montana-based so, Dr. Mark Ibsen knows what it's like to be in the crosshairs. The Drug Enforcement Agency thought he was over-prescribing and raising the risk of addiction and overdose. Investigators came to his office multiple times and he briefly lost his medical license. This is a hostile regulatory environment and I can't do it and I can't help anybody if I'm in prison. So I stopped also and uh, you know my patients were panicked and I helped them taper down quickly and I did my best to help them but I wasn't going to risk my uh, freedom and the DEA came to, take, came to check on me. They came to visit me five times. And it's sort of like the mafia coming to see you. His license was eventually reinstated, but he no longer issues prescription painkillers. Stories like this are not that uncommon. Prosecute one doctor and it sends shockwaves throughout the medical community. Dr. Stefan Cortez from the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Medicine stresses doctors are being squeezed. So there's doctors who truly believe that if they just stop prescriptions, they're in the clear, the patient will be better off, they hope, but they don't know for sure. So we have this perverse situation where if you reduce doses, even if it causes your patient to die uh, from suicide or other forms of distress, the doctor's record looks better, not worse. Physicians, prescribers, non-physician prescribers, etc., are scared. You know, they want to do what is best for their patient, but they are also a regulated profession. And in this current opioid or anti-opioid climate, at least as it relates to certainly prescription drugs, is that they do not want to knock on their door from the Drug Enforcement Administration. And so what we find is that a lot of physicians are opting out of pain management because it's just too much trouble. They're not getting supported and they're be becoming demonized, much like pain patients are becoming demonized. Meredith Lawrence and her husband Jay found out firsthand what happens when doctors put their own needs ahead of their patients. Jay Lawrence would have been bedridden without his pain medication. When the opioid crackdown came, the doctor dropped a bombshell of bad news. And he looked me dead in the face and I'll never forget it, it was the last thing he said to me. He said, my patient's quality of life is not worth risking my medical practice or my license. And he walked out of the room like it was nothing. A few days after he was taken off opioids, Jay Lawrence shot himself. Cutting a patient off cold turkey can be dangerous and even deadly. So the challenge is to strike a balance between the needs of a patient dealing with chronic pain while also reducing the risk of opioid-related overdose and deaths. That's why Dr. Laird requires his patients to sign a written agreement. And the reason I do it is, is number one, to document that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be, but number two, to remind the patients that these are dangerous drugs, they really are, but they do have their place. Up next, the I-Team's George Knapp has more from patients and how new rules and laws have them fearing for their future. On June 24th, 1961, I had an airplane crash. At the ripe old age of 18, fledgling pilot John Lear crashed this plane and was hospitalized with multiple injuries. I broke both ankles, broke both legs in three places, broke my jaw, lost all my front teeth, had a concussion, uh, crushed my neck. Doctors told Lear he would never walk again. They were wrong. 
He spent 35 years as an airline captain, 15 of those as a pilot for the CIA. After retirement, Lear crushed his neck and spine in a mining accident. He reluctantly took two prescribed pain medications that left him in a haze but eased the pain. That ended last year when medical providers were pressured by the CDC and DEA to start cutting back on opioids. And I go down to Walgreens, they said, sorry, your doctor's been down here, says that you're taking an illegal drug, methamphetamine, and uh, I can't issue these. The idea that this 74-year-old retiree who rarely leaves home was partying with meth is ridiculous, but a urine test supposedly showed 10,000 nanograms of the drug in his system. I wouldn't, you know, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what it is. I've never taken a legal drug. I've been flying all my life. You can't take drugs and fly. Lear was in agony without the medication. Plus, his health plan kicked him out. It's not uncommon. A lot of doctors are doing that right now. And, and they're not necessarily waiting for him to die. They're just, just to say, I'm not going to treat you anymore. Or another method that they use is they give him a urine drug test, which are notoriously bad. They're not reliable. Uh, and they'll say, oh, there's marijuana in your system. Um, I'm not going to treat you anymore. In Nevada, as elsewhere, pain patients sign contracts and agree to certain conditions, including random drug tests. Millions of patients who've played by the rules have seen their prescriptions cut in half or eliminated anyway, supposedly as a way to prevent opioid addiction. The unintended victims are the senior citizens. They, if they can't get their medication, they aren't going to go buy heroin and shoot it and die of a heroin overdose. They're going to suffer. Jeremy doesn't want his identity known. He was healthy his entire life, but then needed hip replacement surgeries and developed diabetes. With medication, he managed his chronic pain, enough to still run his own business and support his family. His doctor didn't want to cut his prescriptions, but felt pressured to reduce them by half, which means Jeremy is in pain pretty much all the time and is running out of hope. I want to be a productive citizen, and I don't want my fellow citizens of Nevada or of the United States to pay my bills uh, and, and to cause them to have to do that because someone's trying to manipulate my pain specialist doctor it just doesn't make any sense medically or financially. I changed you to Trefseba. Las Vegas family physician Dr. Maurice Gregory bucks the trend in two ways. He still treats pain patients and he makes house calls to help those with mobility issues. Slashing opioids across the board as a reaction to addicts overdosing on street drugs is stupid, he says. That's like going to a parking lot and you see that almost all of the handicapped spaces are being taken up by people who do not have a handicap sticker. So you say, bright idea. What we'll do is we'll reduce the total number of handicapped spaces. want their medicine and the pharmacies want to stay out of trouble. Patients tell us they've been treated more like drug addicts rather than customers who need to manage their pain. To be honest, I was a little offended. We are not identifying this Las Vegas woman because, well, she doesn't want to jeopardize her chances of getting her pain medicine in the future. Since she's helping to expose a problem many patients across the country face. Do you feel like they're treating you like a drug addict? Yes, yeah, because they all give you that look like, ah, oh, here we go, another drug addict looking to get their pills. She says a work injury led to six surgeries providing little improvement and chronic pain. Today is my medication fill day. She tells us she fills a prescription for her pain meds once a month, which can be a challenge. This morning I will take gabapentin with heart medication. Xanadine and my morphine. Through my shirt? Yeah. The I team put a hidden microphone on her. Does that work? And witnessed her going to not one. They tell me that they can't fill my medications today. Not two. So you're used to getting rejected? Yes. But three visits to find a pharmacy that would fill her prescription. I'm offended because 
I wouldn't be going in and getting my medication if I didn't need it. Offended by interactions in pharmacies like these. Will those be able to be filled here? We would have to call your doctor and to verify them first, because it is a high. We're not familiar with giving them these are high doses of medications. So okay. I can't guarantee you, so we'd have to talk to your doctor, see why they're being prescribed. And this is one of the more strict locations. Pharmacies in general are more strict, resulting in more stories like these. I'd get like four separate prescriptions and I'd bring them to the pharmacy and, you know, one out of four times they'd say, well, we can fill this one. And then I, I'd drive around and see another three or four, oh, we can fill this one. And, you know, until finally I get all four of them filled, but I might have gone to 15 different pharmacies. The I-Team has uncovered some pharmacies are putting caps on the number of pain prescriptions they will fill and turn legitimate pain patients away more and more as a result of the proclaimed opioid crisis. Our culture has, has evolved to a point that you have to, um, you basically have to be anti-opioid, which means a lot of people are suffering. The mega chain CVS announced a new plan to start in February of 2018, which would limit the supply of opioids for patients by giving them medication for seven days only. The CDC refers to pharmacists as the first line of defense, and the I-Team has learned there's a blacklist in some pharmacies naming doctors suspected of writing prescriptions for too many opioids. And I will send them educative materials and let them know about dosing, the guidelines, the real numbers. I will let them know anything and everything I can. I will give them what I'm looking at. And I don't know if that gets me off the blacklist. The prescription gets a closer look and so do the patients. So I have a patient come in and she has long eyelashes and she has her makeup on and she's very figuresque. And the pharmacist says, you know, she looks like a prostitute. I'm not gonna give her medication. What the hell? essentially pharmacies acting or reacting to a massive social crisis where there's a lot of fear, a lot of regulation, and a lot of attention. Well, that pharmacy behind the window is Lord God Almighty. They can do whatever they individually want to do with that prescription. For this patient, a prescription, she says, means less pain and a better life. Muscle relaxer and extended pain medication. According to the Nevada Board of Pharmacy, by law, pharmacists have a right to refuse prescriptions. And starting in January, more red tape for pain patients. All controlled substance prescriptions must include a code for the diagnosis. If it's not there, the prescription can't be filled. Although pharmacists have the authority to refuse to honor a prescription, state law specifies they're supposed to call the doctor to discuss overruling a legal prescription. Doctors and pharmacists told us that part of the law is routinely ignored. We reached out to numerous pharmacies to try to give pharmacists a voice too, but our cameras weren't welcomed. The closest we could get, the pharmacy board, as Patrick Walker shows you. No, I can't. I can't stand very long. She can't stand very long. 20 years ago, Dean and Teresa Winford's lives changed forever. We were stopped and this diesel came from behind and he didn't put on his brakes and hit us going 40 miles an hour. A drunk trucker slammed into Teresa's van. She hurt her back. Doctors thought she would never walk again. They were wrong. But my back was hurting so bad that they were giving me morphine. Since then, she's been through the gauntlet. Surgeries and screws up and down her spine, prescriptions for Percocet and fentanyl. Now she's left with chronic pain and complications from diabetes. Teresa says she is forced to get her hydrocodone and Percocet from visits to the ER because pharmacies are filling fewer and fewer prescriptions for opiate painkillers. They immediately walk away, whoever's trying to help me. They get in a little in a little huddle in the back, and then another one will come up and say, we don't have that. So why is this happening? And time's gone by, we just wrote the medication, we gave it to the patient, they went to the pharmacy, the pharmacy filled it, that was it. Pain management doctor Maurice Gregory says that's all changed. His nurse, Julie McCaspel, fields calls every day from pharmacies to verify prescriptions. But more frequently, she says patients are walking away empty-handed without pharmacies getting the doctors involved. Almost majority of our patients have already faced that type of dilemma where the pharm when, once they step into the pharmacy, pharmacists reject them. 
like without even question. That rejection, a result of profiling. Look, actually my age is an advantage. This instructional video distributed by the Nevada State Board of Pharmacy tells pharmacists how to profile people who might be potential abusers or diverters. In that moment of truth, we must evaluate the evidence in front of us because it's not always who you think. The unintended consequence of this, legitimate prescriptions going unfilled. That leads to people like Teresa Winford and thousands of others trying to fill prescriptions at other pharmacies. As a result, a red flag goes up of pharmacy shopping, thus perpetuating the cycle. At a recent pharmacy board hearing, I asked one of the board's attorneys whether or not patients in this situation have any course of action to fix it. There is a regulation that allows a pharmacist to refuse to fill a prescription uh, before they refuse to fill the pharmacist is required to contact the prescriber, discuss their concerns. General Counsel Paul Edwards acknowledges that this doesn't always happen and that the pharmacy board doesn't really get involved in these cases. But there's another concern pain management physicians like Dr. Gregory have, that pharmacies blacklist doctors they feel are too liberally prescribing opiate pain pills. Nurse Julie McCaspell says she learned from a patient that they were once blacklisted by a CVS pharmacy. Bought his prescription, saw the name of the doctor, gave the prescription back. He said, I'm not filling any medication for that doctor. I also asked the pharmacy board's attorney about that. Is there a way to blacklist, a formal inform or something like there's, that? There's, there's no formal way to blacklist. There's nothing in our regulations that allows for blacklisting, uh, but it, I think it does occur. Again, board representatives say they discourage the practice, but they also say there's not much they can do about it. The Winford say somebody needs to sort it out because they are the ones suffering, along with countless other people just like them. And all they see is a drug dealer. They don't know her medical history. They can see she, you know, she, she's walking in medical shoes and can hardly walk. They see her wristband that she just got out of the hospital. She has papers with her from the hospital, and they don't want to fill it. The pharmacy board says it accepts complaints and concerns and can then determine whether to intervene. Up next, how law enforcement is tackling the opioid issues and the drugs they say worry them the most. I was bent over. I mean, I was doubled over. Patients like Don Reitmeyer say it's a struggle to get their pain medicine. They wound up putting me in the intensive care unit. I made the mistake of saying that I put my car into something if they didn't help my pain. And some doctors say they don't want to get in trouble. There's an environment of fear. They point to new regulations being enforced, creating more hurdles to prescribe and fill prescriptions for pain medicine as a result of the proclaimed opioid crisis. The battle against opioid abuse has become one of the top priorities of the Department of Justice. It was a topic at this law enforcement conference in Las Vegas in October. We have successfully prosecuted seven doctors for illegal opioid distribution. We keep hearing about the opioid crisis. Is it kind of backfiring, though, on legitimate patients and legitimate doctors? It can. Uh, there is regulations out there, and a lot of people don't follow those regulations. Are you hearing complaints from physicians, though, that they do need to prescribe these pills, but they're fearful now of law enforcement? I hadn't personally heard, heard that, but uh, in the United States, we are over-prescribing, in my opinion. Turns out, according to this drug trafficking threat assessment obtained by the I-Team, Nevada is known by police to be among the top prescribers for oxy and hydrocodone, and Clark County is a source to send those drugs out of state. Heroin has grown in popularity over the past two years, but police are worried about the arrival of another drug. Almost overnight, here it is. Fentanyl, a heavy-duty pain medication. Fentanyl deaths are up more than 540% in the last three years. The report points to overdose deaths from fentanyl mixed with other drugs, mainly heroin. But this Drug Enforcement Agency report also points out the fentanyl that's killing people isn't the kind you get from the pharmacy. The fentanyl helps um, 
enhance the euphoria of the heroin. It's also cheaper than heroin, and police say it's being imported in large quantities, mainly from China and Mexico. In 2016 alone, investigators report five separate seizures of fentanyl in Nevada. Uh, it's cheaper to buy the fentanyl than it is the heroin. Metro Detective Brian Grammis says police have discovered people buying pill presses off the internet and fooling their consumers. Xanax, Oxycontin, Loratab, it looks, it has all the markings, looks identical to the actual pill and, and in turn, it's actual fentanyl. A Maryland Sheriff's Office posted this photo showing how little fentanyl is needed to kill someone. Fentanyl is, uh, Probably the most dangerous drug we've had on our streets ever in the history of America. Overdoses have been reported simply from touching or inhaling the drug. While police work on how to equip themselves on handling fentanyl, they have another threat to deal with in Nevada, which isn't even an opioid, meth, which is a stimulant. Back seven, eight years ago, we were buying meth, uh, an ounce of meth for around $1,000. Well, now we're buying it for 300 Two recovering addicts tell the I-Team it's not pain pills they kept finding. It's everywhere. Everywhere. I've never had a problem getting it. Ever. We basically say that our streets are flooded with meth. They really are. So how come opioids are getting so much attention then? I think opioids are getting a lot of attention because they, these are prescription drugs that we use throughout our country that are for legitimate purposes where meth is not legitimate and people like you and I are affected by this. Are you concerned that fentanyl will replace meth? Is that what it is? Yes, absolutely. I think it's going to replace meth and it's very, very dangerous. Some doctors and pain patients like Reitmeyer tell the I-Team instead of using the umbrella term opioid crisis, we need to figure out another way to fight drug abuse to stop people like him from falling through the cracks. They need, to, they need to distinguish, when they're going with opiate death, they need to distinguish, is that opiate a pill? Or was that, was that heroin or was it fentanyl? And of course, it's not just police or pharmacies restricting access to pain medication. There's another culprit, insurance companies. I am one of the problem patients. Bosco Kadick says he relies on opioids to help ease his pain after numerous knee surgeries. Without it, I would be in bed. I wouldn't be getting up and going around. And with the medication, it, it improved the quality of my life. But the disabled veteran says his access to pain medication is getting limited because of federal regulations. Agencies like the Department of Veteran Affairs are lowering doses sometimes even refusing to provide prescriptions for veterans like him. Basically, you were stigmatized as a junkie. We know that for a few pennies from the God-given opium poppy plant, we can save their lives. While pain patients across the country tell the I-Team it's a struggle to get their meds, some also say doctors have required them to undergo expensive nerve block injections. Nicole Ball says they haven't helped. It's not gonna work, and yes, I will be cut off from my medication. So I'm gonna figure out how to pay for it. How do you know it won't work? I've had it done many times, many times. She says she's now used to jumping hurdles for her pain pills. Some pharmacy chains now require pain patients to present two non-opioid prescriptions for every opioid medication they receive. Advocates for pain patients say just follow the money. They point to insurance companies. They don't want to pay for medicine, period. Dr. Maurice Gregory recommends an integrated approach to pain, which includes physical therapy and acupuncture. Dr. Michael Shatman says there were more than a thousand interdisciplinary pain programs back in 1999, but today... Now, outside the VA and the military, we're under 70 of these programs because insurance stopped paying for them. This is a deal to shift money. It's not to save money. Opioids are a very inexpensive way to help people who are truly ill have a life, keep their health up, live longer, take care of their families, take care of their jobs. In other words, this is a farce. And when patients can't get their pills, some are turning to the streets, others to suicide. For veterans, the suicide rate is up because the pain can be just too much to bear. Let's call it like it is, the crisis. It's not the opioid.
opioid crackdown is supposed to prevent addiction and overdose, yet more than 90% of opioid ODs are caused by street drugs. Going after legitimate pain patients for ODs is like attacking Mexico because North Korea launched a missile. Long-term studies show that about 1% of pain patients are at risk of addiction. That number can be even lower with proper controls. The experts say addiction is caused by deep psychological issues, not because of exposure to a substance or medicine. Addiction and dependence are two different things. Chronic pain patients are dependent on their medications, the same way a diabetic is dependent on insulin. Hey, hey. She got a cigarette burning. Put the car in. Put it in front. Five years ago, few of us knew how to spell opioid. Now, these viral images are the faces of an epidemic, wasted junkies obliterated by dope. What did you take? The line between street drugs and prescription medications has been blurred, as if on purpose. Now all drug deaths get blamed on opioids, even though heroin and illicit fentanyl smuggled into the country are the primary causes. Another one of the great frauds and deceptions, and calling it a crisis, it's a crisis in those young people who are out there taking drugs on the street, but these are not legitimate pain patients who are going to physicians, taking their medicines as prescribed. Uh, the idea has taken hold that if you simply stop a pain patient's opioids, you're doing something about an addiction crisis. You are not. Well, I like to play my fingers don't, these two fingers don't work as well as they used to. Las but Vegas PR consultant Terry Murphy admits she is still angry at Big Pharma for what it unleashed more than a decade ago. During the pill mill wave, a member of her family overdosed and died. Another relative lives with extreme chronic pain. Her views morphed when Murphy became a pain patient herself. She had two surgeries on her neck. Opioids and her employees allowed her to run her business from home for almost two years. I did take medication from time to time and because I didn't have to really go out a lot and people understood what I was going through, I was able to do it. Now, I always thought, though, gee, what if I didn't have that luxury? I mean, I, that's a huge luxury when you're going through that kind of pain. What if I was, you know, um, a food server or or a bartender or a construction worker. Murphy could afford alternative pain therapy, so wasn't dependent on opioids alone. She's still angry at the drug companies, but is more nuanced about opioids. According to my understanding, it's a disease that, that can be triggered by sunlight, by mm -hmm. certain types of antibiotics, I think. Mm -hmm. So I may have had it my whole life. It this Henderson it. professional yeah. has endured crippling pain caused by lupus. Opioid therapy allowed him to move, be active. He lost close to 200 pounds, but like millions of others, he battles every month with insurance and pharmacies. The pain is always near. It makes you feel like you just don't, you just want to stop existing. And uh, I would never say that, you know, about my family or my kids and I don't want to be there for them. But um, when you're in that much pain and you just don't see a way out, it's, um, it's soul crushing. I had a hip replacement back in 1990. This patient, Jeremy, is still hanging on, still running his business from home, but he has trouble getting around or exercising now that his prescriptions have been slashed against the wishes of his pain doctor. They go in to get their prescription filled and they go, sorry, we're not taking any new patients. So having done nothing wrong other than get your hip replaced, you don't get anything for pain, even right after surgery. They look at you like you're a criminal too. Like, well, right, you get you treated as public enemy number one. I can sleep at night which is a big bonus. And so, I can actually spend time with my granddaughter. So without the medication, or those years when you were in pain and without it, your life was a mess. It was a disaster, yeah. I felt pretty worthless. Not that I don't now, but I felt worse then. Couldn't leave the house? Couldn't no, work? no. Couldn't play with the kids? No. I shattered the, my uh, L2 vertebrae. At a young age, Gary's body was mangled in an accident. His doctors discovered that because of his genetics, low doses of opioids didn't work. He needed prescription fentanyl to ease his blinding pain. For a while, he had a somewhat normal life. That's gone now. The insurance company refuses to pay for that unless you have cancer because it's, it's so expensive. And, uh, How expensive? They were charging $20,000 a month for my prescription, and uh, 
I asked my doctor, that, that I said, that's insane, why should it cost so much? And my doctor's response was, the DEA forces us to charge that much because they don't want it on the street. So, Yet it's all over the street. Right. Just doctors can't prescribe it, but it's all over the street. Right. It's called the land of the standing rocks. Retired pharmacist Rick Martin can no longer follow his passion as a landscape photographer. Instead, he's poured his energies into advocating on behalf of fellow pain patients. Millions of people have been forced to taper off opioids because of the CDC guidelines. Many physicians insurance companies have misinterpreted, misread, misunderstood an outright lie, as far as I'm concerned, about what the CDC guidelines are intended for. I have quotes from people from the CDC where they say it's voluntary, it's not a rule, law, or regulation. Involuntary tapers are not what they intended. When faced with years of pain ahead and no chance of relief, many who are cut off from medication do what Jay Lawrence did. His wife Meredith bought the gun, then drove him to their favorite park. And he looked at me and said, it's time, I, it's time to go. Um, and put the gun up to his chest and he pulled the trigger and he was gone before he hit the ground, they told me. But I was the one that called the police. Cutting back on legal opioids has not reduced overdose deaths. In fact, the numbers have gone in the other direction. If anything, criminalizing legal drugs creates a black market for far deadlier substances like fentanyl and heroin. So far, the crackdown has allowed insurance companies to cut costs and eliminate sick people from client lists. It has also resulted in suffering and anxiety for millions of chronic pain patients. If you're interested in learning more, we have additional resources on our website, lasvegasnow.com.